A U.S. media reports that just North Korea has begun transferring artillery to Russia as a follow-up to last month's Kim Putin meeting. We take a look at what ramifications it'll bring later down the line if confirmed to be true. Over in Hangzhou, Korean archers beat their Chinese rivals to win gold in the women's team event, marking the seventh gold in a row. A Russian missile attack has reportedly taken the lives of dozens of civilians in Ukraine's northeast. The president of the war-torn country in the meantime says he is confident of U.S. financial aid amid political controversy in Washington. It's October 6, 2023. This is News Center. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yoon Jung-min. Our top story this evening, North Korea has begun transferring artillery to Russia for its war in Ukraine as a follow-up to last month's Kim Putin meeting. That's according to a U.S. media report. Our defense correspondent Chen min Dong takes a look at what ramification it could bring if confirmed to be true. North Korea has reportedly begun transferring artillery to Russia, supporting Moscow's war in Ukraine. Citing a U.S. official, CBS on Thursday reported that North Korea's support for Moscow appears to be the culmination of the rare summit between Kim Jong-un and Vladimir Putin held in Russia last month. However, the news outlet noted that it was not immediately clear whether the transfer was part of a new long-term supply chain or a more limited consignment. South Korea's unification ministry said Friday that it is looking closely into the situation. There is nothing specific to confirm regarding North Korea's cooperation with Russia. However, there have been recent movements between Russia and North Korea, causing concern in the international community. We are closely monitoring the situation in this regard. It is still unclear what North Korea is getting in return for the weapons. However, after the summit last month, the Russian leader hinted that he and Kim discussed military cooperation. And moving forward, eyes are on whether Russia will help North Korea build more advanced satellites and rockets. This comes as North Korea is expected to make a third attempt to launch a military spy satellite in October. North Korea announced that it would launch a third attempt in October. The government is not making any predictions about the launch date and is preparing for all possibilities through close cooperation with relevant ministries. Seoul and Washington have warned Pyongyang that it would pay a price if such exchanges were to take place, noting that any arms deal between the two would be a violation of multiple UN Security Council resolutions. Big repercussions are expected if the allegations of North Korea's weapons transfer turn out to be true, as it would mean that North Korea ignored warnings from the U.S. to support Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The U.S. Department of Defense has yet to comment on the matter, but pundits anticipate that it will make additional measures if a clear movement is detected in the future. Chen min Dong, Arirang News. A Russian missile attack has reportedly killed 51 civilians in Ukraine's northeast. In the meantime, President Zelensky says he is optimistic about U.S. support amid controversy in Washington as he has met with European leaders. Chong eun has more. A Russian missile hit a cafe and grocery store in a village in northeastern Ukraine on Thursday, killing at least 51 people. The regional governor said the village was struck early in the afternoon in Rosa in the Kharkiv region, adding that many civilians had been there at the time. Ukraine's interior minister said residents had been holding a memorial service in the cafe that was hit. The attack was the deadliest in the Kharkiv region since Russia's invasion and appeared to be one of the biggest civilian death tolls in any single Russian strike. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said on Thursday that the Russian terror should be stopped. Moscow did not immediately comment on the events in Rosa. Meanwhile, President Zelensky met with several European leaders on Thursday at the European Political Community Summit in Granada, Spain. The forum was established last year following Russia's invasion of Ukraine to foster cooperation among more than 40 countries from Norway to Albania. President Zelensky met with French President Emmanuel Macron, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, and British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, who restated their commitment to Ukraine. Political turbulence in both the U.S. and Europe has raised questions about continued support for Ukraine. 
President Zelensky admitted he was concerned, but also said he was optimistic about continued support. He further added that Europe has to support the United States during a tough period. So, the situation with the United States is dangerous. Yes, it's a tough period for the United States, and of course it's a tough period for Ukraine, but since first days of full-scale war, we didn't have easy time. So, we are ready for any tough period. A dispute among the Republican majority in the U.S. House of Representatives has complicated budget negotiations and prompted U.S. President Joe Biden to go from confidence that a deal will be made on Ukraine aid to openly expressing concern. Tong eun Arirang News. Back in this country, the opposition-led National Assembly voted not to give consent to appoint Yi Gyun-yong to the position of Chief Justice of the nation's Supreme Court. It's the first rejection of its kind in more than 30 years, leaving the seat vacant for even longer. Our political correspondent Yi shi reports. The National Assembly voted at a plenary session on Friday not to give consent for the appointment of Lee Kuan-yong as the Supreme Court's next Chief Justice. There were 118 votes in favor, 175 against, and two abstentions among the 295 lawmakers present. Currently, the main opposition Democratic Party holds 168 seats out of 298 in the Assembly, while the ruling People Power Party has 111. For consent to be given, a majority of elected lawmakers must be present at the session, and of these, a majority must approve the motion. The disapproval of the motion for consent leaves the seat of the Supreme Court Chief Justice empty for the first time in 35 years. It also requires the candidate nomination process to start over, which means it would be at least a month before the seat can be filled. The DP has repeatedly called Lee unqualified, questioning the history of his personal assets creation and his conservative judgments as a judge. Putting an unqualified person at the head of the judiciary branch will bring a bigger side effect of distrust in the justice system. What the president and the ruling party should do is apologize for failing in its personnel verification and withdraw the nomination. The PPP called for active cooperation from the DP, highlighting the urgent need to fill the seat to prevent any further delays in the court's hearings. Even if the ruling and opposition parties confront each other on political issues, they should cooperate so that the constitutional system can operate normally. Right after the vote, the PPP held a rally protesting the decision. The presidential office said it deeply regretted the rejection of a qualified judge, which would lead to a long-term vacancy in the judicial branch. Meanwhile, the assembly also voted to give mothers the option of anonymous births. This right is intended to prevent them from giving birth outside of hospitals since the passing of a bill in June that required hospitals to report the birth of newborns to a government agency to prevent possible abuse of unregistered children. It also passed a bill to make public photographs of certain criminals at the time of their arrest rather than those taken some time ago. Yi shi Arirang News. President Yoon song nir has promised stronger financial and systematic support for school teachers as part of his drive to protect their human rights and authority in the classroom. Yoon this week met with 20 kindergarten to grade 12 teachers from across the country, saying he would raise allowances for homeroom teachers by more than 50 percent and 100 percent for master's teachers to compensate for their hard work in nurturing the future generation. He pledged to heed the voice of teachers when implementing key revisions to laws aimed at enhancing their rights and authority in the classroom. This came after a series of suicide by school teachers prompted nationwide protests by teaching staff who pointed the finger at their lack of authority in the classroom. As they say, it makes them susceptible to mistreatment by some students and parents. Last month, the National Assembly pushed through four key revisions to the Elementary, elementary and Secondary Education Act to help prevent infringement of the rights of teachers. Games go on until the Hangzhou Asian Games comes to a finale this weekend. 
For the latest, our sports reporter Choi Soo Hyung joins us live. Soo Hyung, Team Korea was once again proven to be the best in archery. Yes, Jungmin, Team Korea claimed another gold medal in archery in the women's team event. As each day in the archery events passes, Korea keeps adding more medals. Earlier today, Korea's women's team secured gold in recurve archery. The trio of Im Shi-hyun, Choi min Sun, and An San beat China with a set score of 5-3, marking Korea's seventh Asian gold medal in a row. Also, this is the second gold in archery in these Asian Games following Wednesday's mixed doubles event that Im competed in with Lee Woo-seok. Im has become a double gold medalist in the Hangzhou Games. She will also compete for gold in the women's individual recurve archery final against teammate An San on Saturday, which guarantees Korea the top two spots. Korea has dominated the women's team event, never failing to win since the 1998 Asia in Bangkok. Moving on to badminton, earlier today, Korea claimed a bronze medal in the mixed doubles with the duo of Seo seung and Choi Yoo-jung. In this Asia, both semi-final losers receive bronze medals and there are no bronze medal matches in badminton. They lost to China's Zhang Siwei and Hwang Yat-chung in a set score of 2-1 in their semi-final. The Korean duo failed to reach the quarterfinals at the 2018 Asia, but they have finished this tournament with a bronze medal. Korea's baseball team beat China 8-1 to reach the final, aiming for a fourth straight gold in the Asian Games. For this, Korea must defeat Chinese Taipei in the final, a team they lost against 4-0 in a preliminary round game on Monday. There are also more exciting matches scheduled for today. There is, at this moment, an ongoing men's hockey bronze medal match against China, which started at 5 p.m. Also, Korea's renowned sports climber Chun Jong-won and rising star Lee Do-hyun will both compete in the gold medal match at 7.35 p.m. Korea time. They finished their semi-finals in second and fourth place, respectively, while Japan took the lead. Ahead in tomorrow's big matches, highly anticipated finals in badminton, hockey and football will take place, with Team Korea aiming for additional gold medals. South Korea's men's team advanced to the Asia final, seeking their third consecutive gold medal against Japan. Korea defeated Uzbekistan 2-1 in the semi-final thanks to mid with Chong Woo-young's brace of goals. Team Korea beat Japan in the 2018 Asia and took the gold, and they will again face off with each other on Saturday at 9 p.m. Korea time. Badminton star An Se-young reached the women's singles final, the first time for a Korean in 29 years defeating China's He Bing Zhao in her semi-final match today. The final is tomorrow at 3 p.m. In women's hockey, Korea will face China for gold tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. after nine years of waiting, following a thrilling 4-3 shootout victory over Japan in yesterday's semi-final. These Asian Games in Hangzhou have only two days left, so here's wishing the very best luck to Team Korea and hoping all our players finish their Asia journey safely and with joy. Let's take a look at the medal standings. The UAE sees South Korea as a potential partner in achieving net zero. That's according to the UAE's energy minister as he spoke with our reporter Park go ahead of the upcoming COP28 in Dubai. The United Arab Emirates is on its way to achieving net zero carbon emissions and sees South Korea as a potential partner to be able to do so. UAE's Minister of Energy and Infrastructure explained how. UAE have announced that it's tripling its capacity, uh, renewable energy capacity, together with uh, the uh, uh, nuclear capacity that we have built together with Korea. We believe that UAE 
will have a, a clean energy contribution of up to 30% by the year 2030 and 38% by the year uh, 2035. And that's put us on track to achieve net zero by 2050. He also added UAE plans to produce and globally export hydrogen, especially clean hydrogen, possibly to Korea. We will be hopefully producing 1.4 million ton of hydrogen and maybe we will be exporting some of that to Korea one day. So we look forward to collaborate with the whole world during COP to ensure that everyone is doing his part to achieve sustainability. As the host of COP28, which starts at the end of November, the UAE aims to unite the world on climate change. What we promised to bring together is the largest COP ever. It's going to have to be diversified. Every voice will be heard. The minister also commented on the current oil prices and how OPEC Plus tries to deal with them. We are trying to balance the supply and demand, and the price is a result. Uh, sometimes it's not, it's not up to us to decide the price. While saying underinvestment is a bigger problem, he ended by saying UAE will expand its oil production capacity in the future. We would require an investment in the level of $500 billion every year to replace what we lose and to bring more resources to meet the growth in demand. And we are raising our production capacity to the level of 5 million barrels by the year 20. Uh, 2027 and instead of 2030, just to ensure that our customers in Korea and in the East are uh, getting the resources they require in the medium to long term. Meanwhile, the Abu Dhabi International Petroleum Exhibition and Conference, one of the largest events specializing in the oil and gas industries, ended Thursday under the theme of decarbonizing faster together. Speakers, including ministers and the CEOs of major oil firms, gathered to discuss ways to phase out fossil fuels. Park Geun-hoo, Arirang News. It is Friday and we are back with our weekly arts and culture segment. Our culture correspondent Song Yujin joins us in the studio. Great to see you back here in the studio, Yujin. Happy to be back here, Jongmin. What do you have for us today? Well, Jongmin, as you know, I just got back from the Busan International Film Festival, BIF, as it's also known. And this year, 209 films from 69 countries have been invited for official screening. So while I was in Busan, I was thinking about which film I wanted to talk to you about. Mm -hmm. And I decided that I really wanted to capture what BIF is all about, which is its mission to build a solid foundation to boost the Asian film industry. So let's first take a look at what this year's BIF has to offer. It's not just star-studded red carpets and prestigious awards that define the Busan International Film Festival. Since it began in 1996, BIF has had a clear mission to promote Asian films to the world. This mission has gained more importance in recent years as Asian cinema, once overshadowed by Europe and Hollywood, has stepped into the limelight. Martin Derwan, founder and director of Europe's oldest Asian film festival, has witnessed this transformation firsthand. I've been going to the Cannes Film Festival for 25 years, and these days I feel incredibly proud to see Asian films making their mark, winning awards at Cannes. For Asian filmmakers and actors, BIF offers them a chance to showcase their creations to a global audience. Like the world premiering movie The Scavenger of Dreams, this film shows the lives of a family of waste collectors in India and touches on bureaucracy, discrimination and the wealth gap. There's a section of society we, um, not consciously, but we just uh, turn a blind eye. I just want, you know, honestly to portray their life. And I always believe, for me, filmmaking is an exercise in empathy. 
another noteworthy debut, Doi Boy. Through the main character who is a massage therapist at a gay massage parlor, the film sheds light on pressing social political issues in Thailand, like ethnic minorities, undocumented immigrants, and sex workers. As each Asian country has its unique cinematic color, more platforms like BIF are needed to showcase this rich diversity. The varied original voices coming out of India, coming out of Hong Kong, coming out of Taiwan, coming out of Korea, is uh, mind-blowing. And, and it is a testament to the fact that, that, that you know, um, th there is an original lens that we have towards cinema that is, that is uh, uh, being appreciated by the world, the way we've appreciated French New Wave or German New Wave or Iranian New Wave. Yeah, as an actors or even for the film directors, we still need like more support, but I think it's getting better since we can connect to Asian uh, filmmakers or film festival, and uh, we have more like more platform to like to share our story. Just like every other year, this year's Biff serves as a gateway for these stories to reach a wider audience. You know what, I can't agree more that film festivals like BIF will play a crucial role in bringing Asian cinema to the forefront. And Eugene, you have been following all the stories there. What caught your attention? Well, it told me there was one particular highlight yesterday because yesterday, as you know, was World Korean Day. So BIF managed to hold the so-called Korean Diasporic Cinema Program, which showcased Korean-American related films, directors and actors. So Korean-American directors Lee Isaac Chung and Justin Chun, along with actors Stephen Yeun and John Cho held an engaging open talk session with the audience where they share their insights about their films and their journeys in the film industry. So this program ends today featuring screenings of films like Minari, Fast Lives, Jamo Jaya and Burning. That is really meaningful. I also heard that uh, streaming services are making a significant impact at this year's beef. You're right, Tommy. So this year, BIF is screening multiple screening service originals. So, for example, the movie Netflix's Believer 2 just had its world premiere yesterday. Mm. But this is not all, because BIF is going to hold the first Asia Contents Awards and Global OTT Awards just this Sunday. So its predecessor, the Asia Contents Awards, used to recognize TV and streaming service content only from Asia. But starting from this year, it has expanded its award coverage worldwide. Great coverage. Thank you, Eugene. Thank you. For this long weekend, typical autumn weather conditions will prevail. Until tomorrow, morning conditions will stay quite chilly, causing big contrast in daily temperatures. On Sunday and Monday, which is Hangu Day, readings will hover around the seasonal average. In the meantime, a rain system will bring showers for parts of the east and the south. Jeju Island will see 5 to 40 millimeters. Eastern Kangwondo Province will see 5 to 30. The south coast can expect up to 20 millimeters. Showers are forecast to last until this Sunday. For regions with higher elevations, dense layers of fog will build up for the morning hours. Heavy fog might reduce visibility significantly, so please drive with extra caution. For the south coast in Jeju Island, gusty winds are in the forecast this weekend. Secure any items that could get blown away. And morning temperatures in Seoul will be starting off at 12 degrees Celsius. Partly cloudy to overcast skies are expected for the daytime. Highs in Seoul, Daejeon and Gwangju will peak at 22 degrees. Gyeongju and Busan will be making it to 23 degrees Celsius. Starting on Sunday, morning temperatures will be on a cooling trend. After this long weekend, clear skies are expected in Seoul. It's all for now, and here are the weather conditions around the world.
That is News Center for tonight. Thank you for watching. A panel session coming up.